There's pictures, there's paintings. Okay, do you have jump spray? <laughs> that was the last recital I did. Uh, I remember Joy Spring. Joy Spring. Uh, Joy Spring. Clifford Brown, not Joy Spring. What? We did uh, Joy Spring. Yeah, I know. You did that. Oh, yeah, she got Joy Spring. Method for Trumpet. 
His music is characterized by colorfulness, Prokofiev-like energetic motor rhythms, and Bartok-esque approach to tonality, and his idiosyncratic, chromatically entwined melodies. Four themes on Anthony Blow wrote four themes on paintings of Edward Munch in 1986. And though the piece is based on four specific paintings of Edward Munch, it is not programmatic. Each movement tries to capture the abstract emotional sense that Plog gets from each painting, rather than narrate the content of the painting. Quote, I remember being on a fine arts grass quintet tour in Sweden many years ago and seeing an ad for a Munch exhibition, and the painting used was The Dance of Life. I had only known of The Scream, and it had really gotten me interested in Munch. End quote. The four paintings that Plog used was, were The Sun, The Dance of Life, Woman Embracing Death, and Starry Night. The ordering is very deliberate and creates a progression from light to dark. The first and last movements are opposites, sun and night, and the second and third movements are also opposites, light and death. Uh, the formal shape is expressed in the music as the first two movements are louder and somewhat fast, and the last two movements get quieter and slower. The clearest manifestation of the gradual darkening is more and more frequent use of cup mute, muffling the trumpet sound. Do you need a copy of the, yes. the paintings or the text? Does anyone have the text? I'll take this one. Thank you. I'm going to listen to Larry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, thank you. I'm on page five. Uh, Norwegian artist Edward Munch was briefly fixated on the sun and painted six versions of it from 1910 to 1913, all of which have a similar fjord landscape color scheme and powerful sun rays. The most famous one was commissioned by the University of Oslo and won, and after he won a competition to paint murals in the university's assembly hall walls. The painting is massive and its rays bleed onto the adjacent murals. Plog states, quote, the sun is such a huge and almost garish painting very bright colors in general. I wanted to write a movement that reflected that feeling. The university says it anchors the Allah's theme of enlightenment, transforming the central task of the university into a majestic abstract image. While one could imagine that most composers would write something fast and loud and dense to portray the sun, Anthony Plog's unique perspective brought us a maestoso, sparsely scored movement. Plog captures the sense of each of enormity and space of the sun rather than the energy and intensity of the light. The piece opens with a solo troubled line and wide intervals in C major, first in ascending ninth, then descending fifth, followed by another ninth. Reordered, they are simply stacked fifths. The organ responds with an expanding cluster chords in the soprano range, pivoting on an F metal tone in the middle before resolving to an F major ninth chord. The next phrases continue the wide intervals while the organ plays cluster chords to contrast. However, these cluster chords are made up of the same interval of contents, fourths, fifths, and seconds, tying the two parts together. The trumpet then pivots up a half step before descending back down on more stacked fifths. Starting in measure five, the trumpet continues its wide interval melody of fifths and ninths, and the, trumpet ex and the organ expands upon its technique of using pedal tones to build color and harmonic motion while maintaining a tonal setter, much like part of the intensity of the volume of the opening is quickly subdued in measure 14 when the trumpet goes into cut mute and the organ plays a single chromatic descending line covering a seven. Interesting for the sign. The trumpet melody inverts the interval content from the opening phrases and now uses sevens and fourths. In the subsequent organ interlude, Plogue continues to expand upon the opening theme in a canon, adding characteristic chromaticism to make the relatively simple perfect fifth bass melody harmonically richer. This sets up the next trumpet melody, which is in D flat, a half step where we was above where we started. The interval of play continues, focusing again on fourths, fifths, and sevenths. The sparse organ part continues to wind through some chromatic sequences before the trumpet enters with muted, a muted version of the opening melody again in measure 33. The mood changes in measure 35 when the organ starts a chromatic ostinato that expands to a seventh and is displaced by an eighth note at every end of iteration. The pedal makes its first appearance in the third measure of the ostinato, playing a chromatic line that by now feels quite familiar. Finally, the opening returns, and we get the full forte once again after the extended wide section. 
The unmuted trumpet in wide intervals feel like a major release after all the muted chromaticism of the middle section. The ending is quite interesting. The trumpet moves to a scalar C major melody, breaking from the wide intervals of chromaticism of the past. The organ plays a C pan-diatonic cluster chord, and then the last phrase, we get what looks like a 5, 6, 6, 5, and 5 chord ending on D major, which is quite a surprise coming from C major pan-diatonic. Likely, the plug was looking for a little more lift right at the end that one gets from the modulation, and in particular from the brightness of the key of D major. The sun appears to be neither setting nor rising in the painting. In fact, Plo confirmed that it was more of a static representation of the sun. Despite the painting's size and brightness, Plo found a way to get much of the, the sun space and quiet. One gets the sense of grandeur of the painting, mainly through the piece's wide intervals and timbral intensity. By building his motive on stacked fifths, Plo was able to quickly derive the full spectrum of color, just like this light of the sun. The Dance of Life, the second movement, was completed in 1899, is regarded as Edward, one of Edward Munch's seminal works. It reflects Munch's troubled relationship with women, an ongoing theme of his works. Though in the background of, the paint, of this painting, the sun, with its unusually phallic reflection, takes a strong position as its progenitor of the characters below, tying it to the previous movement of the piece. It is generally understood that the dance of life portrays the same woman in three different stages of life, combined together in a single, single dance scene. In the left panel, the woman appears in a white dress, hair up, gazing nowhere in particular, and ready to dance. She represents the innocence and hope of youth. In the middle panel, the woman is dancing with a man who is probably supposed to be Munch himself. In the background, you can see the woman being courted by and dancing with several male suitors. Slightly to the right, in the middle ground, we see a grotesque caricature of a man, ready to ravish the same woman. The dancing, the long flowing red hair, and the bright red dress portray courtship, lust, and perhaps a fallen or soiled woman in middle age. Her dress encompasses Munch's feet, taking control of him, and despite their physical proximity, their eyes remain closed and their hands are down, showing emotional distance. The far right panel shows the woman in old age, hands clasped, hair shorter and discolored, gazing regretfully at the couple in the middle, contemplating the sad consequences of love. Anthony Plo took this painting and recreated the general concept, though not necessarily the specifics of the painting. Quote, my idea was to transition from pure or naive to full passion and living to death. So the opening theme, which is naive, at the end is dissident and decadent. To achieve this, Plo writes in Walt's time to establish the dance scene, and starts with the right hand pianist of organ arpeggio derived from Lydian. The double leading tone of the Lydian sound creates a more lifted and optimistic sound, suiting the portrayal of innocence in the left panel of the painting. In the seventh measure, the trumpet enters and plays a descending line that contradicts the raised fourth scale degree, foreshadowing the disappointment of middle age and old age. However, the raised four is recovered again in measure 14, resolving with the descending E Lydian scale. The next section modulates up a half step to F Lydian, and the trumpet plays a new melody built on fourth, fifth, and third, and establishing a eighth note dotted chord on a rhythmic ostinato. This creates a dance like humula over the organ's three beat pattern. Meanwhile, the left hand of the organ enters, playing a transposed version of the trumpet's opening melody. The first major character shift, and likely the moment that we switch to the center panel of the painting, comes at measure 29, when the tempo picks up slightly and the tonal center is shifted to F sharp Lydian. There is a momentary disruption of the meter as well. The organ shifts from arpeggios to a rhythmic eighth note pulse. And the new vertical nature of the harmonies creates a strong sense of contrast while retaining the same harmonic content, F sharp to sharp 11. The muted trumpet melody continues the intervallic mode in motives of fourths and fifths and thirds from the first dance. And the rhythmic underpinning condenses from eighth dotted quarter to two sixteenth eighth note. Additionally, the organ uses pedal and plays a polyrhythm for the first time, starting in measure 38, further destabilizing the music. This all serves to create, increase the intensity and turmoil of the middle stage of life. In measure 30, 53, we return to the original tempo with the faintest hint of a conventional 5-1 modulation from the preceding C pivot 
the tone to F. But the tonal modulation is frustrated by the left hand, and the organ plays a clashing F sharp minor line against the F pedal time line in the right hand. This extended organ interlude gradually gets quieter and consists entirely of parallel fifths, which are foundational to the movement. It has a strong blues, strong blues flavor with dramatic passing tones and descends to a resolution on F, portraying the sadness and disappointment of love, the woman in black feels gazing upon the woman in the middle in the dance, dance of life. Sixteen measures later, the trumpet again enters quiet with a perfect fifth before doubling the blues melody in the organ's left hand. The faster material returns again in measure 77, now in E flat, the half step below where it was turning. And with a more buoyant and scalar melody that bounces back and forth between the organ and trumpet, like a dance. Viewing Munch's painting linearly from left to right, this is very confusing, as it would seem that we have the most optimistic moment at the point where the painting is reaching its darkest moments. But viewing the painting as a dance rather than a static portrait, it makes more sense, as the characters would be revolving around each other in space and time. Finally, we reach the final morbid section of the piece in measure 86, where it once again slows down and is in the key of the four. The organ introduces a new mode of expanding steps to thirds and fifths and varies in the diminution and elongation. Shortly, the organ switches to a quarter note pattern of stacks, fifths, half step apart, and the pattern of chords is inconsistent, giving a sense of hemiolo of the three four meter. The trumpet enters with an elongated version of the opening organ arpeggio at a half step down. The music slows down organically with long rhythms, and the trumpet ends with one more hemiolo opening motif transposed down a fourth. The organ ends with a stacked fifths, a half step apart, built on the B flat, a tritone away from the original key of the B. Stepping back a bit and looking at the movement in its entirety, its arch is a arc is a microcosm of the piece as a whole, as it moves from light to dark, or sun to night, innocence and naivete to despondence and growth and growth. Plo gets a sense of the woman in white with purity and simplicity from the thinly orchestrated Indian and African melodies. The faster tempo, syncopated rhythms, and harmonies that are stacked vertically create more dissonance, which all reflect the vibrance and tone of the woman in the red dress. And the plodding dissonant quarter note chords and the augmented innocence motif in the trumpet melody represent the antithesis for the lady in black. The third movement, there is not actually an Edward Munch painting that is currently known as The Woman Embracing Death, but Anthony Plough was likely reading a different translation of the painting or the engraving that you have there, which is more commonly known as Death and the Maiden. The woman is dominating Death in both, embracing him aggressively and pulling him towards her. In contrast, Death's fingerless hands are hardly returning the embrace, and his odd, horse-like legs almost appear to be pushing away from him. The woman's face has a defined eyes and nose, while the death's face is nearly featureless. Some see this as love's triumph over death, but considering Munch's troubled relationship with women and his mental health issues, it may be more likely that the woman is embracing death and bending it to her will, because she is the embodiment of evil. Of the two paintings, I suspect it is the one on the right, the engraving that Plo was looking at when he wrote this movement, because he describes death as a skeleton. Whereas the second movement was turbulent and rapidly cycled through different musical ideas, creating a sense of dance, Woman Embracing Death feels more static. The image feels like a snapshot, and the engraving's lack of color demands a simpler structure. The organ pedal takes a prominent role for the first time in the movement, with low, hollow-sounding 16 and 30-foot pipes playing eccentric, rhythmically disjunct chromatic lines. The right hand enters in measure 5 in the extreme upper register, playing E-flat-centric lines, the tritone away from the pedal creating horizontal dissonance. In typical plug fashion, it's often varied just slightly, keeping the performers on their toes and preventing the listener from settling into a pattern. The organ continues this thematic concept throughout the movement, an ever-present evil. This is meant to represent death or the skeleton. The cup-muted trumpet, by contrast, plays a quintuplet ascending whole tone lines. It's followed by long sustaining. Though predominantly whole tone, Plug occasionally switches tacks by employing chromaticism to avoid an overly dreamlike sound. In this manner, the trumpet represents the woman, or seduction. The trumpet and organ parts finally interact about two thirds of the way through the piece. The trumpet joins the skeleton's pedal line in measure 34, 
and concurrently the right hand of the organ takes over that line that the trumpet had been playing. Four measures later, the two echo each other, so lines back and forth, and the woman and death become one. After they join together, the trumpet and the woman eventually fade out, and all that remains is death. Finally, Gloag's Night was inspired by Munch's 1893 painting, Starry Night. Once again, there is more than one Munch painting by this name, but the version above, included in the handout, is the most famous and best fits Gloag's description. Its dark colored palette matches well with the music, and it, over, it overlooks a fjord tying it to the sun, the first movement. It is a painting of the view of Munch's hotel room from Moskard Strand, the beach resort south of Oslo. It is interesting how the land, sea, and, and sky interact in this painting. The land and sea are woven together almost in an embrace, and the sky is almost indistinguishable from the sea, and the stars reflect on the water in the same way the sun did in the dance of life. The landscape feels tranquil on one hand, but the dark colors of ominous linden trees on the right side of the painting also make it feel ominous. Night starts with a slow D flat minor seventh chord written enharmonically in parallel fifths, recalling the first two movements of uh, recalling the first two movements, yes. The rhythm is quite the rhythm is quite static, but more predictable than the movement embrace of death, like the landscape in the painting. The trumpet plays a slow, elegant melody. Melancholy minor, A flat minor, with some added chromaticism. The dissonance eases a bit as the organ joins the, trump, joins the trumpet in A flat, then measure six. It, then it moves around in chromatic parallel fifths before making a plagal motion back to E flat. The melody is dominated by chromatic maneuvering while maintaining a basic A flat tone sound. One can imagine the organ as the sound of the waves and the trumpet as a gentle breeze. An unusual detour takes place in measure 18 when the tempo abruptly increases and the organ texture moves to a rapid 16th note arpeggio. The trumpet line, the trumpet plays lines more reminiscent of the sun with its wide intervals. Plogue maintains continuity though by keeping the same chord in the organ and just and voicing but changing the texture. The brilliant but short-lived rhythmic interplay in uh, measure 24 is presented in the organ. And then the organ echoes the trumpet 16th in line a few measures later in 27. After just 10 measures, we return to the original tempo, and the trumpet plays one more line in A flat minor, and the organ plays a dissonant parallel fifth stack a half step apart. In my opinion, four themes on paintings by Edward Munch is one of Anthony Cloak's most unique works. Its connections to and reflections upon Edward Munch's works allow us to access Cloak's compositional thoughts process as we examine how he translated specific images into sound. He has a strong ability to portray the essence of the image and its colors without being literal or programmatic. Plogue states, quote, I think that in the case of Munch, the colors for the different paintings suggested different melodic ideas and or chords, or I guess pushed me in a certain direction. But this is hard to say because I think I just go with what I feel rather than be too analytical. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy Anthony Plogue's four themes on paintings by Edward Munch featuring Mark Willey.